This is a follow-on from my earlier video on hacking the Badger 2040 ID badge. This video is about the game I wrote in MicroPython, Tic-Tac-Toe. It's going to cover some information on computer science and designing algorithms, which are based around graphics programming. It will then cover some specifics about programming the e-paper display and how to achieve a more natural screen refresh experience. This video is going to be split into two parts. First, I'm going to talk about circles and use that to talk about designing algorithms. Normally, you can use the graphics library to draw circles, but that's not available on the Badger 2040. So I'm going to cover some ways you can create circles by calculating the individual pixels using trigonometry, by using lines, and by using the midpoint circle drawing algorithm. A practical example of how computer science can be used to solve problems and a discussion of algorithm correctness and performance. If that's not your thing, then you can skip to a future chapter on programming the Badger 2040 and the e-paper display used on it. If you want to see a practical example of tri trigonometry as well as some ways that algorithms can be developed to improve performance, then keep watching. Still with me? Great. First bit of a disclaimer. Although covering computer science topics, this is going to be simplified a lot. Hopefully it will give you an idea about why some algorithms are better than others and some different techniques for different situations. What we're going to cover is how changes to algorithms can have a significant impact on performance. I'll share one algorithm which is intuitive but very slow, one which trades quality for speed, and finally a better solution which uses a different approach to get optimal quality and speed. Before we look at the computer and how to put this into code, let's think about what a circle is. This will give us the understanding needed to turn it into code. The definition of a circle is a round plane figure whose boundary, the circumference, consists of points equidistant from a fixed point. When we think of a real world, you can think of it with the help of a pin, some string and a pencil. If you set the string to a fixed length and use that to draw around a central point, then you've got a circle. In reality, it's a bit difficult to draw using a string, which is presumably why Galileo invented the compass. The compass is much better for drawing circles by hand, but we'll be simulating the string in the examples on the computer. In the computer, we don't really use a compass or some string. Instead, we need to do some calculations to work out where the end of the string would be if drawn on the computer screen. When we translate that to the computer, what we are looking at are individual pixels on a screen. Imagine instead of drawing the pencil around a smooth motion, what we need to do is to colour in each individual pixel, then move the pencil around and colour in the next pixel, and so on, until the circle is complete. Here is an example of how you would draw that. The green line represents the string, and each of the blue dots represents a pixel. This is only approximate. The pixels are shown oversized, and it's updating in increments of 10 degrees. What we need is a way to efficiently calculate each pixel to draw a smooth circle. The first one I'll look at is if we use the normal trigonometry functions to calculate each x and y position as we sweep around the circle. Effectively, like we are drawing with virtual string, drawing a pixel at each position. So here you can see that if we update each pixel, one for each frame, then it provides a circle. But how do we know where the end of the string is? This is where trigonometry comes in. We can create an imaginary right angle triangle as shown here. The green line, the hypotenuse, is the string and we know its length as the radius r. The orange line across the bottom is the distance from the center of the circle along the x-axis. The purple vertical line is the distance from the center of the circle along the y-axis. We need to find x and y, which can be found using trigonometry functions. x equals the radius times the cosine of the angle, and y equals the radius times the sine of the angle. 
Note that because the y coordinates used in computer graphics normally increase as you move down, then to draw the position as shown in this diagram, the y value would normally be subtracted from the centre point. Now here's the Python code to do that. Note that I'm using the angle as degrees, but the math trigonometry functions need it in radians. So I've done that conversion first. This works and gives an accurate circle. The problem is that this is very processor intensive. The trigonometry functions takes a lot of cycles to calculate, perhaps thousands of cycles depending upon the accuracy of the trigonometry functions. If we have to calculate each pixel, then we need to do that for the entire circumference, which is 2 pi times the radius. In the case of a circle with a radius of 200 pixels, then that's over a thousand pixels. So we're looking at potentially millions of processing cycles. That's just for a one pixel wide outside line. I won't be going into filled circles, but one way of doing that is to subtract one from the radius and then calculate those points, effectively calculating each pixel in the area of a circle individually, which for a circle of radius 200 would be over 100,000 pixel calculations. This gives an idea of the amount of work. In this example, it's calculating 600 of the pixels in each refresh. I'm running this on a powerful computer and it is using a lot of processing power just for this one circle. Does that mean that this is a bad algorithm? Well, possibly. It depends upon the specific circumstances where this is being used. But if you put in hundreds of circles on the screen, as I showed at the start of this video, then that's going to be incredibly slow. The code I'm creating is to run on a microcontroller which has much less computing power compared to a PC. So I'd like to use an algorithm with better performance. Before we leave this, there are ways of improving the performance of this algorithm. One way of doing this is to imagine the circle partitioned off into eight segments. Each of these segments is a mirror of the other segment. By transposing the values for X and Y, then you can work out each of the other segments. This means we need to make one eighth of the number of calls to the trigonometry functions. This can be an improvement, but it's still based on a lot of individual calculations. This is shown in this demonstration, drawing eight segments at a time. Although I won't be using this algorithm, this is helpful later when we look at another algorithm. The problem is that whilst there are some little changes that you can make to make a small improvement in performance, the underlying algorithm is very processor intensive. Whilst I probably can use this in my project, it's really not a good way of drawing circles. The next algorithm I looked at is something you may call cheating, or perhaps a better term is an approximation algorithm. Whatever you call it, the aim is to have an algorithm that creates an approximation of what is desired, or in this case, something that looks like a circle, even if it's not. This is actually quite a common technique, especially for problems that are NP-hard effectively those who would need huge amounts of processing power to perform a certain task, such as the classic travelling salesman problem, which is about choosing an optimum route between cities. The idea of using an approximation algorithm is that rather than trying to calculate every possible solution to find the shortest, which can work for a small number of cities, then instead you have an algorithm which works out a route that is approximately the best solution. We also use approximations in other aspects of computer science. For example, JPEG images you capture with a camera use a technique to reduce the size of the files by using a lossy compression algorithm. The aim is to have a picture that looks the same to a human as the original, but uses much less storage. The approximation I used with a circle is to have something that looks like it's made up of curved lines, but is actually made up of straight lines. This is particularly useful for use with a Badger 2040, as the library has a function for drawing a straight line, but not one for drawing curved lines. At its most accurate, a line could be just one pixel long, and it would be exactly the same as a true circle. In the case of my 200 pixel circle, that's made up of about a thousand lines. Or we could reduce it to only 100 lines, a hexagon, or 10 lines, a decagon. This shows an approximation of the circles using lines. As you can see, when you reach about 35 line segments, then it becomes virtually indistinguishable from a circle. 
That's approximately 10 degrees for each line segment, which is what I use on the Badger 2040. This shows the actual code used to create that. This is in MicroPython, as used on the Badger 2040. The radius defaults to 10 pixels, and the degree step size is used to determine how many degrees to move by when drawing each line. Using 10 degrees gives 36 steps. The first for loop works out the points using the trigonometry functions we mentioned previously. And then the second for loop draws the lines with a final line to complete back to the start. A performance improvement would be to save these points so they don't need to be recalculated. But this method is fast enough to recalculate when required. We're now going to look at a more efficient algorithm, which should give better performance. This is known as the midpoint curve drawing algorithm. There are some different variations based around this algorithm, so this is just one particular implementation. I don't take any credit for creating this algorithm. The previous examples were fairly intuitive, but this one is more mathematical based. It's based on research by Petaway in the 1960s and Van Aken in the 1980s, with similar work by Bresenham in the Bresenham Circle Drawing Algorithm. This illustrates where math is a key part of algorithm design. For this to work, we need to consider the circle split into eight segments, as we used previously. We will calculate the values for the XY segment and then apply the various translations to calculate for all eight segments. This algorithm is based on calculating a single arc in the XY segment. And this is the midpoint circle drawing algorithm. We start with a known point where X is the radius and Y equals zero. In the next pixel, I either leave x the same and increase y by 1, or we decrease x by 1 and also increase y by 1. To determine which of those to use, we first find the midpoint, which is p, of the two possible values. And if p is on the perimeter, we plot x with y plus 1. Otherwise, we plot x minus 1 and y plus 1. And then to determine if it's inside or outside the circle, we use the function x squared plus y squared minus r squared. If that is equal to less than zero, then it's inside the circle. If it's equal to zero, then the point is on the perimeter. And if that is greater than zero, then the point is outside the circle. When running, this looks the same as the earlier demonstration using x segments, but it needs much less processing time to calculate each of the points. This shows the main part of that code, it's written in Python. This is much simpler than having to make calls to the trigonometry functions for sine and cosine. To evaluate these three different algorithms, I'm going to look at two aspects. The first is correctness. Often that is a mathematical proof, and I'm not going to go into that here. Essentially, using two trigonometry is going to be accurate, or at least as accurate as the sine and cosine functions as it's just basic mathematics. The midpoint circle drawing algorithm is less intuitive, but it has been shown to calculate the correct points for a circle. The second example, using straight lines. Mathematically, this is not correct, unless the line is only one pixel long. But for the purposes of this circle, only needs to be convincing to the user. So as long as the line segments are small enough, then it is good enough. There are circumstances where this may not be appropriate, but for the intended purpose, then it is. So, in terms of correctness, these all pass that test. Another way of analysing the correctness of an algorithm is testing, especially looking at edge cases. It's not something that was necessary here, as I was just looking at whether the output looked like a circle or not. The other aspect is performance. This is often to refer to it as an algorithm's computational complexity, or time complexity. There are two common ways of working this out. One is mathematical analysis of the algorithm, often looking at how many times a loop or nested loop is called. A common method for this is known as big O notation. The other is by measuring the performance based on how long it takes to run. First is important whether an algorithm is used for processing data and the performance is impacted based on the size of the data that is being processed. 
I'm not really going to go into detail for either of these here, but I have created a video that shows how you can measure performance in a specific circumstance. In reality, I just looked at the number of calculations being performed to get a feel for the performance. It's not a scientific method, but sufficient for my needs. I decided to use the straight line method as a compromise. It reduces the number of segments needed to draw a circle. The main reason to use that over the midpoint circle is that it's more intuitive and easier to understand for someone looking at the code. The display library also includes a line drawing function, so it's easy to use that. Generally, when drawing circles, you would just use the one that is supplied as part of the library, as that is already be optimised for the particular platform it's running on. It's only because there isn't a circle function in the library for the Badger 2040 that I even looked at this. Hopefully this has given an insight into how different algorithms can be used to perform the same function. It's shown how some algorithms may use a compromise to improve performance and show how maths can be used to create optimal solutions. The next thing I want to explain is about the use of e-paper displays. You've probably heard of e-paper, also known as electronic paper or e-ink is perhaps best known as the display used on the original Kindle ebook reader from Amazon. Its main advantages have been in terms of power, a more natural appearance compared to backlight displays, and the ability to view it even in bright sunlight. Perhaps the most important for the badge is the low power consumption. In particular, it only needs power when updating the display, then it continues to display the last screen, even if power is completely removed. The main disadvantages is that they are normally only two colours. This screen has only black and white. There are some displays with three colours, such as the Inky Fat, but full colour displays are very rare. The way that the screen refreshes is one of the frustrating parts when creating a game. As you can see here, when changing the display, the screen is flooded with colour and then blanked out to prevent ghosting. This is what I'll be looking at next. The game I designed uses a cursor. It's shown here as the small black square in the centre of the screen. This is moved around using the cursor buttons on the right and the A and C buttons on the bottom of the badge. If you use the default settings, then the screen will flash several times each time you try and move the cursor, which is quite frustrating. The good news is that there's something we can do to improve the situation. There are a couple of options to avoid this full refresh. One option is to only refresh part of the screen. The other option, which is the one I chose to use here, is to perform a turbo update when moving the cursor. There is a ghosting effect when using this, in that the previous cursor is still visible, but only faint. I saw that this is a good compromise, as it makes it usable. Whenever the select button is pressed, then it switches to a medium update, which incurs the screen flicker. This actually works well in this game. It's a pass and play game, and so the large refresh indicates the time when you would pass the play to the next person, or if the game is won. The reason for covering those first is to make it easier to understand the code. So, now I can explain how the rest of the code works. Essentially, this is a simple pass and play game. The cursor is moved around the 3x3 grid, and then clicking on it places a naught or a cross, depending upon which player it is. Each time either a naught or cross is placed, then the code also checks to see if there are any rows of three to indicate a win, or if all spaces are used, then it becomes a draw. The other thing that you need to know is that I use a state machine within the code. Basically, the state is whether the game is in play or not, and the code reacts differently based on that. So here's the code loaded into the Sony editor. I'm going to give a, a quick overview of how this works. So the code starts with the functions that have been created with the main part of the code coming later. The draw function is used to draw the screen. It draws the four lines for the grid and then draws any of the noughts and crosses that have been placed. The GX and GY variables stand for grid X and grid Y. 
and these are used to make it easier to follow. It then looks at the state of the game and if we're in play mode it shows whose turn it is and draws the cursor or if the game is over then it displays who the winner is or if there's a draw then it shows that. Now see that we've got a draw naught and a draw circle function. The draw naught is a high level function which takes the grid positions, the GX and the GY we were looking at earlier. And then it converts that to the actual coordinates on the display before calling the draw circle. And the draw circle is the one that actually draws the circle. And this uses the straight line algorithm that I've explained already. The reason that I do this as two separate uh, functions is to allow the draw circle to be used when it's not on the grid, such as showing which player is playing, and the draw naught to be used within the grid to make it easier. The draw cross and draw x take the same sort of concept, but much simpler as it's just two lines for creating an x shape. And then we've got the draw cursor, which just draws a small rectangle for the cursor. There's some helper methods or helper functions. Uh, this one just converts from the grid system to the coordinate system of the actual display. Now there's numbers here that are hard coded into these. So the grid size is 30 between each segment and these x and y values are hard coded. It's not something I would normally do but because this is designed for this very specific screen then these are going to be fixed and I don't need to change them. If I was coding something that was going to be a bit more flexible might be on different screens then I would replace those with variables. There is one function checks every possible line to see if there's a winning combination. And then this is the main part of the program. So we start with setting the state and setting the initial settings for the grid and the player that's playing, etc. Calls the draw and the update is required for the display to update itself. And then it's got a, a while one loop, which is while the game is playing. And then an inner loop, which is used during the game. And then it breaks out of this inner loop if the game is won or if it's a draw. As you can see, update sets the turbo mode when the cursor is moving and then this handles moving of the cursor and then if B button is pressed then if there's nothing in that position at the time then it will put that current player in that position and will then break out of that for this is, for, is one to be tested and that's where we come out of this in a loop. I've got some suggestions for future improvements. I'm not going to go into these myself, but I'll leave them as an exercise for viewers if you're interested. The first is that you can only play the game once and then you have to click the reset button to start the program running again. So an improvement would be to have some extra code that allows a button press in the game over mode to restart the game and the play will continue. If you do that, then you'll also need to reset the state of the grid. The next suggestion is to randomise which player starts. At the moment, it's always a cross. Or another option may be to have it alternated between knots and crosses, especially if you're having multiple rounds in a game. 
You may also want to create a computer player, perhaps with different levels of difficulty. One of the things with tic-tac-toe is that following some simple rules, it is always possible to either win or to force a draw. That would make a good hard difficulty, but you may want to include some random element to allow the human player to at least occasionally win. If you make any of these suggestions or create your own improvements, please leave a comment on this video with the details. It'd be interesting to hear if anyone takes this further. Whilst this video has been about creating tic-tac-toe on the Badger 2040, it's really been a way to give a basic understanding of some computer science concepts, about how different algorithms can impact on performance, and also about how sometimes you can create a program that goes against conventional thinking. Understanding the maths behind this is a step towards creating more complex algorithms. If you found this useful, please give it a like and let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more videos like this. If you've not already subscribed, then please do so and click on the notification bell to get notified of future videos. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you on a future video.